Welcome to this video on AS Computer Science, and today we're going to talk about software development. Now, in the lessons, we've been talking about different methodologies and different ways that we approach software development. And we're going to talk again about the waterfall cycle, agile, extreme programming, spiral, and rapid application development. Now, there are different strengths and weaknesses to each of these, and what we're going to look at today is how you can use them. And we're also going to look at the, the strengths and benefits of each of these. The other three bullet points, writing algorithms and testing and solving problems, these are going to be co covered in later lessons. So let's move on. So the first thing that you need to understand is that methodology is the way that you produce your software. It's like a roadmap, how you get from A to B, and it's how we develop the software and make sure that it's delivered on time to our customer. So that's why we need to look at these methodologies, because when you do your A-level project next year, you're going to need to pick a methodology and you're going to need to develop that piece of software. Now, the first thing that you need to be aware of is that there is a feasibility study that should be done at the beginning of every project. This is basically to make sure that your project is viable and that people are going to actually take it on board and employ you as the software developer, as the project manager. So you need to look at the technology available to you. You need to look at budget. How much is it going to cost you? Are you going to need to spend billions or or, or are you going to need to get more staff in? Do you, do you not have enough staff? What are the legal implications? Are you going to be breaking the Data Protection Act? Are you going to need to actually look after people's data? Are you going to be apps looking at copyright in case there's already a piece of software that's been patented? So you, these are all things that you need to consider, particularly how you're going to get from A to B and how it solves that problem. And then, last but not least, you're going to need to look at the schedule. And you can remember this for a simple word, telos. Technology, economy, legal, operations, and schedule. So that's how you can remember some of the things we need to consider in the feasibility study. Now, once you've done the feasibility study, you need to sit down with your client and find out what their requirements are. At the end of the day, you're going to need to build this piece of software and make sure that they know what, they, what they're getting. They're going to have to agree some standards before they go ahead. The analysis job, which is you in, in this instance, particularly with your A-level project next year, you're gonna to need to make sure that the, you fully understand all the customer's needs. You're going to make sure you ask questions like, how is it going to be designed? What do you need? How am I going to meet these needs? What operations are installed? Maybe how is the help desk going to use it? There are a lot of questions that will need to be asked in order to get a, a really detailed set of requirements. So the first life, the first methodology that we're going to talk about is the waterfall life cycle. Now the waterfall life cycle is well known and it's traditional and it's what a lot of people have used in the past for their projects and as you can see here it's a set of steps we've got the requirements and analysis at the beginning like with most projects then we go on to our design our coding our testing and our maintenance. Problem is it only works if each stage is completed the first time around and if it's completed on time. If, it's, if you have one of these stages that takes really, a really long time, it can slow up the process of the others. Now, this can be improved by adding iteration. So instead of finishing your requirements and moving on, what you could do is go back around and see if there is a way of actually improving that set of requirements before you move on to the analysis. And then during the analysis, you could go back around again and look at the analysis or you could do the same with design. So adding iteration to it makes it a bit more reflective and it means that your, your project is going to be a lot stronger. Now the advantages of the waterfall is that it's simple, it's easy to follow. You've just got one step to another, to another, to another, and everybody is able to be responsible for a specific task. So you can say, Johnny, you're going to do the feasibility study. You're going to be our analyst. You can say, Robert, you're going to look at our requirements. You're going to do the design. So you can split it up easily because of how once a certain thing is finished, you move on to the other. And there is expected output at each stage. So in order to move on, you need to show that there's some documentation, something that's finished. We also have 
disadvantages. Unfortunately, with the waterfall model, the risk is that it's not installed, it's not until testing that you can actually see the results. So you could have spent a lot of time, money on this project at the beginning, and then you get to the end of it, and then it's like, ah, you haven't listened to my requirements, and now the project's not viable. Think about the NHS system that costs billions, okay? Requirements, if they're misunderstood, again, that's going to have a problem with our budget. And you should only use the waterfall method for short term projects. If this is a project that's going to be lasting a number of years, you need to think about one of the other methodologies that we're going to be talking about. The next one is rapid application development. Now, rapid application development is probably one of my favorites because it involves the use of prototypes. So yes, you have your analysis and design at the beginning, but what you, once you've got this and it, and it sets, once you've got your analysis done, you can make a product, go to your user and see what they think of it. And if they don't like it, it can be amended and you have a level of iteration and the user ends up evaluating the prototype at each time, giving some feedback until the client gets what they want. Once that's, that's ready, we move to testing and eventually to deployment. Now, this is really good for projects where you've got a customer that's not really sure what they want. So if your customer's going around in circles and making, and basically you, you meet with them the first time and they're not really sure, you can make a prototype and then they can realize, aha, actually, I want to add this to the product or I want to add this. And the good thing about continuous feedback is that it means that the product can be excellent for usability because by the time it's finished, it's been to the user a number of times and you're going to end up with a really good project. So it focuses on the usability rather than how it works. Now, disadvantages of this is that it's not good for products where the code needs to be really, really locked down and efficient. The problem is it's looking at the usability rather than the programming under the hood. So you can have problems uh, where things will fall over. It's not really suitable where the client is unable to commit. If you've got a client that is absent quite often and they're not turning up to meetings, your product's not going to be very good when it's finished. So the project doesn't really scale well and it's not suited for large projects with big teams. If you have a smaller team of people that are going to work on the prototype and go around in a circle, you want to think about using RAD. Okay. The next one we have is the spiral model. Now it works on a high number of risks. So it looks at all the risks, whether it be on budget, whether it be on time, uh, because projects, let's face it, can run out of time because requirements can change so often. So the spiral model was designed to take into account all of the different risks that are involved. The good thing about it is that it focuses on managing these, these risks, whether it be on budget, whether it be on time, whether it be technical constraints, maybe you haven't got the technology available to you. So there are four stages that it needs to look at. These four stages are to determine the objective. So you need to obviously do your requirements and look into that at the beginning of the project. You need to then identify the risks and consider other options. Now, sometimes at phase two, when we're identifying these risks, the project can stop because we can realize that it's actually not viable and we're gonna run out of money. Now, if it goes ahead, that's where we start actually making the piece of software and testing it with people. So it's great. Then we get to stage four, we actually review it. If, it. if the product isn't finished and it's not very viable, we'll move on and make the changes and we will start determining our new objectives and changes that need to be made. So the advantage of this is that it looks at your risks. If you, if you have limited resources such as budget, time or technology, it's good because it takes this into consideration and you're going to end up with a project that actually comes out on budget and on time. And it's ideal for a project where it is high risk and you have a time that it needs to be co complete by. It's, so if you've got a large project with a lot of risks, whether it means that this project must be completed by this date in order for this new building to open up, say, for example, it is a hotel booking system and the hotel is going to be open in a number of weeks, this system would be ideal. Problem is, it can be expensive because it you need a good risk analyst you need somebody that knows what they're talking about 
at each of these stages. If you have a weak risk manager, then the project's going to scale out of control. So you need to pay the money to get a good risk analyst. So, and that's the main disadvantage of using this approach. So the next methodology we're looking at is the agile programming methodology. The agile methodology is designed to cope with requirements that change through producing the software. So when I produce a piece of software, the requirements might change because I can see, see that that doesn't do what it should do. So I'm going to change. So each version of the software is built on the previous. So I guess the way, the way that you could explain this is that where you've got where you've had Windows 8 and then they released Windows 8.1 because that was built on a previous version and there were a number of things that weren't fully considered and changes that they had to put in to help meet the, the audience's needs. Uh, so think about the waterfall here because in the if this was the waterfall approach, the user wouldn't actually realize the problem until the end. The good thing about agile programming is it gets it gets there by actually considering the requirements and building on a previous version. So an example of this is extreme programming. This puts a lot of the emphasis on coding. So if in an exam question, you're expected to talk to, talk to people about putting emphasis, uh, which methodology you would use if the coding was really important, you'd go for the extreme programming because it represents the customer's requirements and you can do much more tests and you can actually involve the programmers and get the programmers actually working with the user while it's happened. It's much more iterative and it's shorter, shorter than RAD, uh, because the, generally the processes only last a week long, whereas in RAD, the process can last four to four to eight weeks. It can last a lot longer, all right? It uses proto prototyping in each iteration and, it, and basically each is like a mini finished product. It's good enough to actually release, just there might be similar changes, okay? Features, it can feature paired programming. So basically I could have another coder sat next to me giving me instructions to do the program and then one person that's analyzing it. So we can switch roles and the good thing about it is that the code is 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 at priority. So you get a, a strong piece, you get a strong product at the end of it because what's happening is no programmer works on a project longer than 40 hours a week and people swap products over and over again. So, for example, if I'm working 39 hours, I will be tracked and they'll realize that I'm about to work at 40 hours. So they will switch the programmer in so that the coding is of good quality. And every programmer is responsible for the entire program. They must code to standards. So I may come up with naming conventions to make sure that everybody labels their labels with LBL at the beginning. I may label all my variables with uh, VB at the beginning of it, just, just so you get an understanding here. So the advantages of this is that the quality is likely to be high. The quality of code is always high uh, with this and the team of programmers that make the code is a lot stronger because of the rules that they have to work to. And also, it, because it's paired, you've got two eyes are better than one. The disadvantage is that the client needs to be able to have, a, needs to have a representative to represent the team. If they don't have that representative there, you're not going to get an improved product each time. Disadvantages, again, if the team of programmers are not, uh, can, might not be that strong if they're distributed globally. If they're all in one building, you're going to have a strong product. But sometimes if you've got people working in different sides of the, the world, it's a bit different. It's a bit difficult to actually communicate with those. So some exam questions that you want to consider here and you want to try out, you might want to explain which methodology you might do if you were building a website for a customer and the type of things that you're going to need to consider there are what sort of communication are you going to have with a customer? When you build a website, you don't generally go and get your requirements and build the website and there, it's done. You need to involve your customer and ask them at multiple points what they think of it. When you're building an operating system, do you have that interaction? How, think about when you've used Windows or Mac or any operating system. Has somebody come to you on a regular basis and said to you, Okay. Oh, what do you think of this? What improvements would I make? 
does that happen with an operating system? Is there an iterative approach there or do you just end up with a product at the end of it? What about a new games console? Think about the number of people that are going to need to work together on that. And then you're going to have these discussions about waterfall, which is better, is agile better? Now, what I will say is each of these questions can be anywhere between six and eight marks and your spelling and grammar is important, but make sure you explain what the methodology is in full. It might not ask you that in the exam question, but they want to know that you know your stuff. So explain what the methodology is and show your advantages and disadvantages before you tell people why you've went for that approach. So just bear that in mind. I hope this video has been helpful to you if you're studying computer science. Uh, please press uh, the subscribe button below if you'd like to subscribe to my channel. I upload videos uh, quite often when my students have finished a lesson. Thank you for watching. Speak to you soon. Bye.